Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. This is the News at 7 on AT International. I'm Ruth Aguele. Let's bring you the headlines. <music> President Buhari receives new foreign envoys, reiterates Nigeria's commitment to global peace. <music> Conversations on climate change heighten at World Economic Forum as Nigeria warms up to join Global Plastic Action Partnership. Plus, Africa secures additional 400 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine. President Muhammad Buhari says the federal government under his watch does, will not, does not and will not allow religious prejudice or partisanship to influence any of its decisions and policies aimed at taking Nigeria to the next level of socio-economic development. Addressing members of the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs during a courtesy visit, the president maintains his solemn disposition to be fair and just to all segments of the society. We will definitely bring you that report in our subsequent bulletin. All right, let's look at all the issues arising. President Muhammad Buhari has reiterated Nigeria's commitment to working with the international community towards achieving global peace, food security, and sustainable environment. Now, this was while receiving an audience three new ambassadors posted to the country on tour of duty. State House correspondent Adam Musambo reports. The three new envoys who are in the State House, Nigeria's seat of government, to present their letters of credence to President Muhammad Buhari are Ihad Mustafa Award of Egypt, Faisal Ibrahim Al Gamdi of Saudi Arabia, and Alejandro Francisco Herrero of Argentina. Addressing the envoy shortly after, President Buhari congratulated them for officially commencing diplomatic functions in Nigeria. He hopes that their respective mandates will be utilized towards improving cordial relations with the country consistent with the Vienna Convention and global best practices. Nigeria also enjoys very good bilateral relations with your respective countries. We are to pursue bilateral dialogue as well as build cooperation on the basis of constructive mutual respect in a shared vision for the future. Nigeria is a nation of great diversity and we are ready to always convert these diversities to advantages. In addition to the United Nations, President Buhari said all the three countries are also members of the G77 and the South-South Cooperation, which Nigeria is proud to be associated with. Nigeria and the home countries of the envoys, he said, have common challenges, which include terrorism, insurgency, climate change, population explosion, human trafficking, corruption, poverty, and proliferation of small arms and light weapons. On top of all this, the second wave of the coronavirus pandemic has come with different strains that force additional challenges to the initial outbreak. These challenges underscore the need for the international community to work even more in concert to collectively identify appropriate ways and means to globally resolve these challenges. Ambassador Ihad Mustafa of Egypt, who spoke on behalf of the envoys, assured the president of their commitment to work with his administration to further enhance and strengthen their country's friendship and partnership with Nigeria. We noted with appreciation the effort exerted to make us feel welcome. We would count on your kind support and guidance to this end. The three new ambassadors were earlier on arrival accorded a befitting diplomatic welcome by officers and soldiers of the Presidential Guards Brigade. From the State House, Adamusambo, NTA News. 
384 Nigerians have been evacuated from Saudi Arabia. The returnees comprising 300 males, 83 females and one child arrived at Inam Diazikiwe International Airport Thursday afternoon. Now the returnees will be quarantined at the Federal Capital Territory Hajj Camp for 14 days in line with the revised COVID-19 protocols by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19. It will be recalled that Nigerians in Saudi Arabia have been stranded as a result of visa expiration and restriction of travel as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Let's talk about the environment. The world is said to be in a fight for survival of planet, nature and biodiversity. United Nations Deputy Secretary General and Nigeria's former Minister of Environment, Amina Mohammed, alongside other speakers at the World Economic Forum on Climate Action, insists that the time to act is now to protect the environment. Let's hear more from Onenge Feinfis. Conversations on mobilizing action on climate change at the World Economic Forum considered how major economies can accelerate efforts to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goals. A zero emissions future offers remarkable opportunity for business, for clean green jobs, for economic growth, and to use the president's words to build back better from the global economic crisis. In the UK and other countries have shown that uh, over the last 30 years, you know, in the UK we've managed to grow our economy, GDP by 75%, cut emissions by 43%. Green growth is absolutely possible, and I think if we work together, we can have success. United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amin Mohammed said, young people must take the centre stage in showing climate ambition, just as global financing needs to be increased to meet the Paris Agreement. But finance matters. And if we're not going to get the finance that is going to um, be invested in these just transitions, it's going to be incredibly difficult for us to live up to whatever commitment that we make. The 2030 uh, timeline is important because it is now that you want to respond to that green recovery. Meanwhile, Nigeria is poised to officially join the World Economic Forum's Global Plastic Action Partnership, a platform that works with governments, businesses and civil society organizations to translate plastic pollution commitments into concrete solutions. The announcement emerges from the Devil's Agenda, a global summit convened to choose bold solutions to curb the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure a green and inclusive recovery in the years to come. On Fine Face, NT News. And to speak more on the conversations at the World Economic Forum on Climate Change is Kristen Hughes, Director, Global Plastic Action Partnership. She joins me via Zoom from Geneva, Switzerland. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. All right, now, um, in joining the Global Plastic Action Partnership, we're made to understand that Nigeria will work with the World Economic Forum to launch a national plastic action partnership. Now, that is based on promising model that has been piloted in Indonesia, Ghana, and Vietnam. Can you share with us the key features of this model? Absolutely, and thank you again. And we really, we're so pleased, we're so thrilled to have the opportunity to work with the government of Nigeria to form a national plastic action partnership. A number of the first few steps we'll take will be around our three pillar approach. The first and foremost, which was alluded to already, is bringing together the stakeholders, the civil society and academics, the government policy makers and change makers, as well as the corporate and private sector leaders, all converging together to try to, to share best practices and look for ways to fight the plastic menace. The second pillar in our approach is around gathering insights. So utilizing data to create a baseline assessment, which will help the government of Nigeria to better understand exactly where the plastic flow is coming from mm -hmm. and then how we can address it. So putting together an action roadmap that actually shows the steps that can be taken in order to address the plastic menace. And then that third pillar will be around how we finance those actions. So. Whilst the Global Plastic Action Partnership itself is not a check writing organization, we are looking to make those connections between funders and financiers and innovations and the other needs that are needed in order for us to create a circular economy for plastics. All right. And at the forum, you said plastic waste and pollution are intrinsically tied to a nation's ability to build a sustainable and thriving economy that leaves no one behind, if I'm correct. Now, in what ways um, will the World Economic Forum support Nigeria in turn and the tide on plastic pollution? 
Yes, absolutely. The current take, make, waste model is simply not sustainable. Uh, it's taking a toll on the environment and human health. Therefore, we're, we're, we're looking to create a circular economy for plastic that will eliminate waste and, can, and promote the continual use of natural resources as an alternative approach. This can actually yield incredible in, uh, economic benefits as well as health benefits. Yet less than 10% of the world's global economy is recognized as circular. That said, I will say that, that Nigeria has already taken a leadership position in creating the African Circular Economy Alliance, along with the World Economic Forum, UNEP, Africa Development Bank, and a host of other African nations. We've already seen this leadership in the electronic waste sector, and now we're going to be looking to learn from those lessons and to build on them in the plastic waste sector. So really, how can we build these public-private mm. partnerships to amplify the impact that the circular economy agenda can have throughout the continent, utilizing Nigeria as a leadership position and to learn from that and to, to help shape others? So we're really looking forward to engaging okay. the Ministry of the Environment to build a plan for the country's transition to a circular economy for plastics. Okay, Kristen, very briefly. Briefly now, um, from what you're saying, what would you say are the opportunities available to Nigeria if we have to turn plastic waste into wealth? Not uh, and also bearing in mind the challenges associated with waste management. Talking about in Nigeria. Well, I think you've just hit it right there. It's, it, waste management is one of the key issues. So mismanaged plastic waste and unsustainable plastics production is very commonplace, not just in West Africa, but throughout the world. High volumes of plastics. Uh, production without any consideration of reuse or design as the end goal. So we're looking to just build the capacity to manage collection, sorting and recycling of plastic waste, while also increasing awareness of what sustainable practices can actually be amongst businesses and consumers. We're also exploring innovative and alternative models that can support re reuse and reducing of plastics. And I'll tell you, there's some really great innovators already in, uh, in Nigeria looking to create these opportunities. Um, a young innovator, Bilikis Abiola, who's finding ways to incentivize a change in consumers' recycling habits, for example. And then lastly, we're also exploring and supporting new and innovative financing models, such as asset recycling, blended finance, and credit enhancement, and others. And we're completely, we're, we're looking forward to completing this journey and working so closely with the government of Nigeria to make the plastic eradication and the reducing of the plastic menace a reality. Thank you very much. Of course, the opportunity abound. Kristen Hughes, Director of Global Plastic Action Partnership. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's look at all the issues arising. Secretary General of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, Mohamed Sanusi Barkindo, says the declaration of cooperation in its fifth year has helped the industry traverse two historic downturns by bringing together 23 oil producing nations to help return balance to the global oil market and achieve a sustainable stability in the interest of course of both producers and consumers we hear more now from lydia samson the COVID-19 pandemic pervaded almost every aspect of daily lives with widespread lockdowns, economies in major distress and many businesses shorted in. In terms of the oil and gas industry, every producer was impacted. No one was immune. The Declaration of Cooperation, now Charter of Cooperation, illustrated in April 2020 when the price of West Texas intermediate crude oil went negative and the industry faced a potential crude oversupply of nearly 1.3 billion barrels. Again, OPEC agreed on the largest and longest production adjustments in the history of OPEC and the oil industry. OPEC Secretary General said this is an outstanding example of the multilateral approach which ushered in a new era in global energy cooperation. He said the diligent and coordinated response to voluntary production adjustment decisions taken by the DOC helped rebalance the market and revived the industry. Oil market stability and more broadly energy market stability will be vital to the energy transition. Stability begates stability and this will be essential to help him bring on board the huge investments required in the years ahead. Barkindo says it has been 
one step at a time guided by data analysis and robustly supported by the strong multilateral process of OPEC already in place. He said the pursuit of global multilateralism to help drive the global energy transition cannot be overemphasized. Though vaccines offer some needed light at the end of the tunnel, the ever-increasing number of COVID-19 cases, human loss, as well as renewed lockdowns are a harsh reminder of how delicate the situation remains. Nevertheless, Perkindo says OPEC is cautiously optimistic of global economic rebound in 2021, as well as for significant oil demand growth. He calls for continued month-by-month -month approach to assessing market conditions while standing ready to take any necessary action through the DOC. In Abuja, Lydia Samson, NTA News. We go on a break now. We're back. Stay tuned. What limits you? Nothing. Who defines you? No one. Can you go everywhere with unlimited super fast internet access, free Intel to Intel calls, and crystal clear quality conversations? You can do and be whatever you want to be. Intel, live. Thanks for being there. The federal government says it will not fold its arms and watch Amnesty International continue with its negative reports on Nigeria. Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed stated this during an interactive session with newsmen in Abuja. Anthony Forsen reports. National had published a report to mark 100 days of Lekki protest, accusing the Nigerian government of cover-up since the Lekki Tollgate protest. Reacting to the publication, Information and Culture Minister Lyle Mohamed said Amnesty International should get its facts right or better still remain quiet. If Amnesty International has any proof, let it come out without proof or shut up. Let Amnesty International take advantage of the pressure power and quality set up by the Lagos State Government to go and tell them the names and the addresses of the 12 people that they claim were shot at the target. Otherwise, they need to shut up and stop, you know, annoying us. The minister wondered why Amnesty International will derive pleasure in portraying Nigeria in bad light and look the other way when it has to do with other countries. We say Amnesty International. They do not say one word. When the American government arrested and are busy prosecuting those who invaded capital hill. The American government has vowed we will search and arrest opposite anybody involved in the attack on Capitol Hill. But when Nigerians now want to arrest and prosecute those hoodlums that are responsible for the killings of 37 policemen and six soldiers. Amnesty International will not find its lost boys. What kind of double standard is that? The Amnesty International report claims 12 people were killed during the NSAS protest in Lagos. In Abuja, Anthony Forsen, NTN News. On the global scene, Africa secures additional 400 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine just as South Africa's military ends hijab ban for Muslims. Joyce Omitil is standing by with details.
As vaccines begin trickling into the African continent, the Center for Disease Control says the African Union has secured an additional 400 million doses of coronavirus vaccines for its members. Now, this comes on top of another 270 million announced earlier. It's estimated that Africa will need 1.5 billion vaccine doses to vaccinate 60% of its inhabitants. In the meantime, a World Health Organization team has come out of quarantine and will start underground investigations into the origins of the coronavirus in the Chinese city of Wuhan. The scientists will begin interviewing people from research institutes, hospitals and the seafood markets linked to the initial outbreak. Meanwhile, some Chinese cities are using samples taken from the anus to detect potential COVID-19 infections as China steps up screening to make sure no potential carrier of the new coronavirus is missed. Study shows that traces of the virus in fecal samples could remain detectable for a longer time and provide more accurate test results. Now, new reports show that Pfizer and BioNTech say their vaccines have shown to be effective against coronavirus variants that emerged in Britain and South Africa. And from Bangladesh, we hear that the country has started its COVID-19 vaccination drive in the capital, Dakar, with plans to administer more than 30 million doses over the next few months, while India says it has successfully curbed an increase in COVID-19 infections, with a fifth of its district reporting no new cases for a week. Looking at global case numbers... More than 101 million people around the world have been diagnosed with COVID-19. In Nigeria, a total of 22 people died from COVID-19 on Wednesday, with 1,861 new cases reported by the Center for Disease Control. Now to other news. South Africa's military has changed its dress policy to allow Muslim women wear hijabs with their uniforms. It is a victory for Maj Fatima Isaacs, who led a three-year legal battle for her religious right to wear a headscarf beneath her military barrette. And that's where we end this segment. I am Joyce Ometu. Well, as the coronavirus continues to spread fast with upsurge in the number of new cases daily, key players are intensifying efforts towards the acceptance of the COVID-19 vaccine as Nigeria expects the delivery of some doses. Abubakar Usman Okwanga reports that the National Primary Healthcare Development Development Agency is facilitating the latest engagement with northern traditional rulers to enhance capacity response of community to allay fears about the COVID-19 vaccine at its 2021 first quarter meeting. Sustainable global effort in mitigating impact of COVID-19 is gradually shifted to the development and application of vaccines and collaborations such as this is critical in defeating this scourge. The engagement session, matters, therefore, is to strengthen measures on community concerns. awareness this and acceptability of COVID-19 vaccination to control the spread of the virus. The National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, which is the federal government agency, with responsibility for vaccine-related matters, has brought together a highly professional and dedicated multi-sectoral team to drive the process of introducing safe and efficacious COVID-19 vaccine. The Ministry of Health has concerns about getting his job done under those circumstances. Hence, this meeting to explain the nature of the vaccine to our traditional fathers in order to gain your support and backing. You being the custodians of community values and custodians of progress. This is a task that we're committed to doing, but it is a task that we cannot succeed at without the leadership provided by your royal highnesses. Experts say the falsehoods around the COVID-19 vaccines should not prevent Nigerians from allowing themselves to be vaccinated, more so when scientific and clinical examinations have proven the vaccines to be safe and effective. They followed all the guidelines, all the um, safety protocols, and they were approved by FDA. So the vaccines are safe and they will protect at least the most vulnerable. 
key players say collaboration will be strengthened to ensure the defeat of the coronavirus pandemic, leveraging on the efficacy of the vaccines and the non-pharmaceutical measures. The two holy marks in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is also to reopen for Nigerian pilgrims under stringent COVID-19 safety protocols and vaccination. But see, we be in condition for being able to come to Saudi Arabia to perform Hajj this year. The National Hajj Commission of Nigerian Plant Nationwide Awareness is scheduled to commence soon to ensure compliance with universal safety measures. In Abuja, Abubakar Uswana Kwanga, NT News. More than 159 million naira has been presented to families of deceased police officers who died during the answers violence. Now, this is part of the life insurance and the Inspector General of Police Family Welfare Scheme. Francis Form reports that the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, presented checks to beneficiaries calling on Nigerian media to continue support, supporting security agencies for their sacrifice. It is a moment to remember sacrifice by the gallant police officers and men who died while ensuring peace and order in their fatherland. So, for that, this initiative by the police to support family of officers and men who died in service is another honor in addition to giving hope to the survivors. Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed said security agencies and the citizens must work together in ensuring that Nigeria is secured, peaceful and more developed. I want to please uh, assure the relations of the departed uh, gallant officers that the force will not abandon you and that the people and government of Nigeria we appreciate what your loved ones have done, the fact that they've paid a supreme sacrifice. And also Inspector General of Police Mohamed Adamu assured of more motivational initiatives and support to the police. I urge you all to please utilize this phone being given judiciously in meeting the training and welfare needs of the children and wives of the deceased persons. With regards to the officers that were injured, I'm also glad to know that the group personal accident medical expenses are also being processed and they shall be paid in due course. The Nigeria police lost some of its personnel during the NSAS violence in October 2020, exactly 100 days ago. Francis is from NTN News. And we're done with the news. Thank you very much for your company. But do connect with NTA. Let's fight against rape and rapism. Ruth Aguale and my sign language interpreter is Timothy Tinat.